Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this discussion on US foreign policy uh, in Syria in the age of coronavirus. We have a great panel of uh, experts and uh, government officials um, with uh, from the State Department. He'll be talking about US policy on Syria, uh, what has changed, what hasn't changed, in the in the wake of the coronavirus, given the dynamics on the ground, um, we are um, we feel privileged to have Jumana Kadur from uh, Atlantic Council, non-resident senior fellow. I'm sorry, uh, Richard Olson actually works with Ambassador James Jeffrey, special UN uh, Syria envoy of the U United States government. And uh, Jumana Kadur is non-resident senior fellow with Atlantic Council. Um, that's a recent appointment. Congratulations on that one, Jumana. She'll be talking to us about uh, governance and civil society um, in Idlib, as well as counterterrorism and peace building efforts. Um, and she'll, she'll have insights on US policy, but also Turkey's policy. Uh, to in the region. And then we have Will Todman, Associate Fellow in the Middle East Program at uh, at CSIS. And he's going to talk about uh, humanitarian, um, importance of humanitarian access to Syria and what's happening at the UN in that context as well, uh, as well as any other um, issue um, that they would like to address because this is a great panel of experts and we feel privileged. Um, I wanna thank our attendees now. Um, we are broadcasting live on uh, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, also Facebook, unless there are technical glitches. Uh, but anyway, uh, before further, uh, without further ado, I wanna to turn to Colonel Autzen for his remarks. Um, please, uh, Rich, thank you for joining us again. Uh, we appreciate your uh, thoughts on this. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Kadir. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I, I appreciate the work that SETA is doing, um, along with a number of other excellent um, think tanks and thought leaders uh, in Washington. This uh, has been a wonderful aspect of a bad situation to see um, how events like this can still go forward and in some new ways bring people together. I'm very pleased to be here with uh, Jumana and Will uh, with um, the reputations and, and the um, sort of body of work that they've done and the excellent organizations they represent as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you my main point up front. Uh, COVID has not really changed our Syria policy much. Uh, in some ways, it's, it will be more of the same. Uh, and I think with even greater prospects for success, that's uh, the, the great takeaway. Let me explain. Uh, as an introduction, I'd say that we, we should remember two years ago, some observers were predicting an outright regime victory in Syria. Uh, there have been several arcs or phases to this brutal war. And the, one of them, if you count it from say 2015 to 2018, was a period of uh, regime gains against the opposition, taking advantage of the world's focus on ISIS to a degree and concerted efforts uh, by regime supporters such as Russia and Iran to crush the legitimate Syrian opposition as the U.S. and the coalition were crushing, uh, crushing ISIS. That dynamic is no longer driving this conflict. Thanks to U.S. leadership, the coalition has crushed the territorial caliphate and rendered ISIS uh, a scattered terrorist group on the run. Not that they've lacked capabilities for attacks from time to time, but this is a very different scale of threat than what we faced uh, in, say, 2015. It is no longer a terror state that controls territory which is essentially what it aspired to be. It's true that the regime regained territory and inflicted brutal atrocities and casualties against the towns and people of Syria during that period, but they've run out of room to run roughshod over the long suffering Syrian people who are ready for a fair political outcome. Now the regime uneasily contemplates what lies ahead. The Syrian pound is at all time lows, uh, almost up to 2000 uh, per dollar. Financial support for the regime is drying up and COVID is only gonna accelerate that and accentuate that as well as the fall in uh, oil prices and other energy prices, which affects some of its key supporters. Assad's forces are struggling to maintain control of areas that they've put a boot on, and there's no prospect of seizing Northwest or Northeast Syria by force, uh, at least not in the near term. If you look at uh, 
internal dynamics of the regime, things going on with Rami Makhlouf, uh, the seizure of his assets, uh, Syria Tell, the three videos he's put out and now on Facebook, we see that there are real stressors within the regime, somewhat driven by the resource problems they've had. Uh, the issue of Maher al-Assad's fourth division uh, attacking an Alawite town, Waja al-Hajr, in the western part of Homs, uh, after a Tarbush, uh, an ally of, of uh, Maher was assassinated, shows that the uh, privations being suffered by common Syrians, even in places that are they're fairly friendly to the regime, uh, are casting a contrast between the very privileged uh, network that uh, are close to Assad and the rest of the people. We can talk a little bit about Caesar Act too. Caesar Act is going to be a very big, if not a game-changing event starting on June 17th when it's applied. The Caesar Act provides for you, uh, new U.S. tools to help end the conflict by promoting accountability uh, for the Assad regime and persons responsible for atrocities and war crimes. The Act provides for mandatory sanctions and travel restrictions to the U.S. of various persons responsible for support uh, or complicity in serious human rights abuses in, in Syria. And a lot of people worked a long time uh, with the U.S. Congress to get uh, the Caesar Act passed. This includes direct support to the Syrian military and indirect support, reconstruction, oil, aviation sectors, things that haven't been really touched by previous rounds of sanctions. And the goals are to deny the regime financial resources and to send a strong signal to third parties that there will be no reconstruction uh, of Syria with international support as uh, so long as we have an unconstructed, unreconstructed regime and we have not gone through the 2254 process. There's also an executive order 13894 from last October that gives additional authorities. We need help from the international community to continue to document, as Caesar himself did, uh, the sort of violations that result in sanctionable behavior. But these are all reasons, all these dynamics, uh, to think that the regime to maintain what they've been doing. The way has been and remains clear for clearance uh, of this impasse and end of the Rich, Rich, my apologies. I think we lost you just a little bit. And, you know, can you rewind by like half a minute or a minute, if you don't sure. mind? Did you, Thank did, you. Did, uh, did you hear Caesar? Caesar? It, yes, after Caesar, you said all this, and then I sure. think it froze. All, all this, uh, essentially means that people who have predicted a regime victory or who think uh, that the end of this is clear and it does not result in 2254 being implemented, I think their case is getting weaker, uh, even as the regime is getting weaker. There is only one way to, to get past this impasse for Syria, uh, an end to the conflict and political transition through the process laid out in 2254. The U.S. continues to provide critical life-saving aid through this to Syrians, regardless of where they reside. And I wanna make it clear that our, our sanctions are not targeting the Syrian people. And there is US aid that has gone uh, to people even in regime controlled areas uh, for humanitarian purposes. But there will be no reconstruction of Syria without implementation of 2254, period. There will just be an uneasy and increasingly isolated and targeted weakening of the Assad regime. We believe that the international community including Russia, as well as our friends in the coalition and other responsible parties, understand this, and that 2020 offers a real opportunity to move forward in fulfillment of 2254. And in, in some ways, uh, the pre-COVID and post-COVID periods are notable only for the strengthening of these dynamics. A quick word on the regime atrocities. The Assad regime has waged a war against the Syrian people for more than nine years. This has led to the death of more than half a million people and the displacement of 11 million more. The numbers displaced equally, uh, equal fully one half of Syria's pre-war population and the group likely knows that. The Assad regime and its partners continue to commit mass atrocities against the people of Syria. The regime is responsible for innumerable, innumerable such atrocities, some of which rise to the level of war crimes and crimes against humanity. These atrocities include the use of chemical weapons, killings, torture, enforced disappearance, and other human, inhumane acts. The regime's brutal campaign of violence against its own people has destroyed integral civilian, medical, humanitarian, and economic infrastructure. The regime and its allies have repeatedly dropped barrel bombs hitting hospitals, schools, and other civilian infrastructure, including UN deconflicted hospitals and schools. The UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria reports that it has documented 
instances where government forces deliberately attacked schools and therefore committed war crimes of deliberately targeting a civilian object and deliberately attacking civilians. The regime continues to engage in extensive repeated campaigns of arbitrary arrests and detention targeting individuals perceived to be supporting opposition groups by government forces, including women and children. And this clearly impedes the ability of the UN and other humanitarian actors to deliver cross-border assistance to Syrians. What we're seeing today in Syria, uh, an economy in freefall, squabbling amongst Assad and his inner circle, uh, and two United Nations reports in one week, uh, about a month ago, slamming the regime for these atrocities, shows the futility of any attempt to rehabilitate Assad. It's not going to happen. There is no future for Syria outside of a political solution, uh, as outlined in UNSCR 2254. And in fact, the pressure will only rise with the operationalization of the Caesar Bill's uh, provisions in June. Without going on uh, in greater detail, I'll just say humanitarian assistance, as I mentioned, has gone on. The United States in the past uh, decade has provided now over $10.6 billion of humanitarian and stabilization assistance to the people of Syria. HA for critical life-saving support goes to all of Syria's 14 governorates. There's a number of unilateral and multilateral contributions ongoing, including increased assistance due to the COVID and Idlib crises. When ambassadors Jim Jeffrey and Kelly Kraft visited the Turkish-Syrian border in March, they announced $108 million in new humanitarian assistance and implementation is ongoing. And more recently, we've committed nearly $18 million to prevent the spread of COVID in Syria. Uh, the key problem now, and, and I think maybe Will's going to talk about this, uh, goes to crossings and to access and how we get a lot of this aid in. But the underlying humanitarian problem remains the intransigence of the regime and its supporters in failing to engage on a political resolution to the conflict and in com uh, continuing to commit brutal aggressions against civilian communities in areas outside of regime control. We will continue to work with our allies and partners to ensure all that can be done to improve the lives of Syrians in the most threatened communities. Uh, is done while applying maximum pressure to incentivize um, serious negotiations. And, and we will not flag in those efforts. Thank you, Rich, for laying this out for us. Uh, I think it's a great st point to start. Um, so, uh, Jumana, uh, I'll go right to you for your initial remarks, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kadir and Sita, for, for hosting us. Um, and it's, it's an honor to be next to uh, my co-panelists. Um, I'm going to focus a bit on the, um, the governance issues that we have in Idlib, sort of the fate of Idlib at large, uh, before Will goes into some of the more, you know, the, sp the specific humanitarian issues um, that the area is, is struggling with. Uh, but but just to take a step back, um, so, so as we all know, Astana was, was meant to set sort of the framework through which Russia, Iran, and Turkey were meant to sort of deal with uh, with the areas of Syria, most specifically Idlib, and lay, lay really where the buffer zones were supposed to be, the fate of the M4 and M5 highways, um, and the question of terrorist groups, specifically HTS, um, and, and what was, what was, you know, what they, the Turkish government was sort of charged with doing under that framework. Now, um, as you know, and, and as, as, as both Turkey and Russia have sort of made uh, has been brought to the public eye is that, you know, the uh, the Russians and and the Syrian government um, argue that uh, because terrorist groups were never eradicated by Turkey from Idlib, that that gave them sort of a carte blanche to you know further their offensive in Idlib, um, uh, and and violate uh, the ceasefire that we uh, that we saw them do in a very horrendous way uh, since last December, culminating in the displacement really of 959,000. Syrians, the largest displacement Syria has ever seen um, until March. Um, we, saw, we saw obviously that that ended with the killing of 33 Turkish soldiers by Syrian government forces um, with knowledge of Russia. Um, and then eventually this, this, uh, this pair very pivotal moment uh, forced negotiations and eventual ceasefire that is held more or less uh, with some obviously daily uh, um, violations of the ceasefire on, on, on a smaller scale um, until today. But that being said, uh, the Turkish, uh, the Turks have lost, um, you know, some critical uh, cities. 
the Austrian opposition and, and you know, with the Turkish observation points, the Marit and Oman, Saraqib and Kaframbul, which were really critical uh, to the Syrians living in Idlib, those were all lost and have now uh, returned to uh, regime control. Um, I want to talk a little bit about HTS because of the continuous um, conundrum it has placed the Syrians of Idlib in, uh, but especially for following the US and EU pull out from supporting civil society activity in those areas. So as we're well aware, there's, you know, there is a, a significant number of, uh, of military presence, of HTS military presence. It's, it's mixed with foreign, you know, foreign fighters as well as the local fighters. Um, you know, it is, it's been made clear both by Turkey and others that the, the foreign fighter leaders of HTS are really not just solely Turkey's responsibility, that it should be an international responsibility because it, continue, it will pose an international threat if any of those fighters try to return back home um, or leave Syria. Uh, different civil, Syrian civil society organizations have, have presented, all, you know, options, ideas for what to do with local fighters. Um, disarmament, you know, DDR camp, you know, programs, etc. But all in all, uh, the consensus um, on on by most Syrians on the presence of of uh, HTS in their areas is quite clear. Um, although some people have tried to, you know, some analysts, I think, in recent uh, in recent terms, have tried to sort of rehabilitate rehabilitate. Um, the possibility of HTS being a cooperative player in Idlib, many Syrians have come out very much strongly against this, um, arguing that, you know, Jolani himself and uh, the most prominent uh, HTS leaders are viewed in the same way that Bashar al-Assad are viewed. I mean, the, the levels of oppression, the closing down of schools, closing down of women's um, empowerment programs, etc., are just as much of a threat uh, um, as, as, as uh, Assad to them. Now, the HTS claims to have administrative operations through which they run government-like services. Um, you know, make, make no, you know, um, mistake that the Salvation Government does not enjoy, you know, the kind of social support uh, that would be required for them to be, you know, a legitimate player in Idlib. Um, they, they have major problems with, uh, by detaining, you know, regularly civil society activists in Idlib. Um, and, you know, they continue to act really like warlords and monopolize resources in Idlib. Um, they're in charge of uh, Bab el Hawa, uh, that's the most profitable, um, you know, uh, border crossing for them. Uh, they recently opened up a border crossing that the regime uses. Um, they are, they fully monopolize uh, fuel, diesel, and high voltage that is used by civilians in the Northwest. Uh, even when the regime was undergoing you know, severe fuel shortage. Uh, HTS was still uh, managing, you know, the fuel uh, for the Northwest areas. They, they were buying it and they were selling it and, and monopolizing really its use um, in the Northwest. Um, and, you know, so it's no, it's no surprise economic con trade continues um, in, in parts of Syria, whether it's with ISIS, HTS, the regime. This is, you know, this continues to go on, but, you know, HTS is really, um, used its its place and its power to ensure itself more as a warlord warlord excuse me as opposed to um uh, any positive governing um, mechanism for these areas now that doesn't mean there aren't alternatives um to hts um in in um in the Northwest. You have the Idlib Health Directorate, which has really been a very active player, especially during uh, the COVID response. Um, they have been working with the WHO on, on um, ensuring the safety of many Syrians and doing, you know, helping distribute tests, etc. The White Helmets continue to be a very critical um, you know, part of Idlib's infrastructure. There are also still local councils. And although HTS has tried to meddle with local councils by forcing some of them to appoint certain people that are close to HTS, they have not been able to take over these local um, councils entirely. And then there's also the interim government, um, which unfortunately has not been able to expand um, or be allowed to work um, in some critical areas, including in Afrin and the Euphrates Shield areas, but they can further be operationalized. Um, and I think, you know, going back and, and, and looking and taking a deeper look at that um, is something that we haven't done in the recent past. And, and I'll tell you why. So, um, you know, the, the, the problem was in 2017 that a critical stabilization aid was cut. Um, and once the United States government 
pulled its stabilization funding, the Europeans quickly followed suit. And this is something that has been brought up by a variety of different civil society actors and you know, a number of different um, forums, but the problem still exists and it should still be addressed both by the US government and Europeans. Um, a huge burden has been put on civil society. Uh, frankly, it's too huge of a responsibility um, to provide necessary services. And this is what has caused them oftentimes to go head to head with HTS in ways that they are not equipped. Frankly, civil society is not armed. Um, it is hard to, for them to um, go head to head with um, uh, armed groups who claim to, you know, not only do they monopolize the resources and the economy, but they also hold guns. And then at the same time, they're running a salvation government and, and trying to appear as though they can manage um, governance responsibilities. Um, it, you know, there was, from my perspective, there was really no good reason to stop funding for governance um, as, as a, you know, in addition to my role at the Atlantic Council as a non-resident fellow, I am also the co-founder of a humanitarian organization. We've been able to continue our humanitarian work um, unhindered by, by HTS. And um, I think that there are ways, many ways that Syrian organizations in Idlib have been able to navigate around um, HTS, but pulling out the funding has really put a heavy burden um, on sometimes even humanitarian organizations to do work that they were not equipped to do. And the sec second thing that I would mention on this, just in terms of, of US policy, is that even if HTS was a bit um, disbanded tomorrow, even if the Turks were able to really make a dent in a, re a clear dent um, and, and break them, you know, break the, the structure of it, uh, there are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in civil society to um, counter the, you know, the radicalization. Um, and that needs to be done by civil society organizations that once again, like I said, have been deprived of necessary funding to do this work. Um, and then, and then, in terms of where the sort of the U.S. and and Turkey, uh, you know, um, can can assist one another, can um, do some of this work together. You know, militarily, we saw that Turkey um, went head to head with Russia, um, which we may dif differ with Turkey on a variety of issues, but that but Turkey really going head to head with Russia was able to stop the massive bleeding that we saw happening in Idlib for months. Um, and I know, you know, it was made clear by the U.S. and both by NATO that that we had um, that we were behind Turkey, Turkey's right to defend itself. Um, but there needs to be um, there needs to be a clear signal to Russia and the Syrian government not to attempt to violate this ceasefire, ceasefire even post COVID, uh, because we do support Turkey in those efforts in maintaining that ceasefire after. And finally, I'll just end with one actually um, policy recommendation for the Turks is that. You know, and, and for the Turkish government, while it's, you know, um, it has, you know, the, the border crossings that Will is about to talk, they, they provided critical aid uh, through the Turkish border um, to humanitarian organizations um, in Syria. But unfortunately, we have yet to see the Turks um, view Syrian civil society as a partner in Idlib, um, especially in the Euphrates Shield and Afrin. Um, you know, we know that uh, this can be challenging, right, to, um, to sort of figure out. Uh, there, there are many issues at play in Afrin and Euphrates Shield, uh, but, but there are civil society organizations that can really be a key player for Turkey to work with, to be the local face and the local voice in areas that Turkey currently dominates. And I, I think for the longer term, that's something Turkey um, needs to start integrating into its program. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Jumana. Uh, I'll go right to Will. Will, please. Thank you so much. Well, I just want to echo what's been said before. It's it really, um, I feel honored to be on this panel. It's awesome to be speaking alongside Jumana and Rich, and thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I think I'm going to t talk more about COVID and I, I think focus on the humanitarian situation. And COVID is in Syria. Uh, I think so far the number is uh, 64 confirmed cases um, in Syria, that's 58 in regime held areas and then six in the Northeast. And it's clear on every level that the spread of COVID-19 in Syria should prompt an increase in humanitarian access. Syria's healthcare system is incredibly ill-equipped to deal with an, an, an outbreak. It's been downgraded, it's been fragmented, it's been destroyed throughout uh, what more than nine years of conflict. And 70% uh, and, and of the uh, of Syrian uh, healthcare 
workers have fled the country. Um, it, it's terrifyingly unprepared to, to face a widespread outbreak of COVID-19. Um, but even maintaining current levels of access is far from guaranteed uh, at the moment. I would argue that Assad has viewed the pandemic as a new opportunity to capitalize on, on human suffering and to try to undermine his rivals. Uh, looking at what's happened in the Northeast, I think is particularly telling. He, uh, the, the Assad regime has systematically uh, prevented UN agencies from, uh, from building up their healthcare capacity in the Northeast of Syria. Um, and it's prevented the WHO from setting up a testing facility to detect COVID-19 there. Um, instead, the, the sort of smaller amounts of aid that are uh, allowed to reach the area are often funneled towards medical facilities in, in, in pockets of the region which are held by the regime, um, like the Qamishli National, National Hospital. Um, and this obstruction um, of, of UN operations has been possible because of what happened in the UN um, in December and, and January um, of this year. Russia and China blocked um, UN agencies cross-border access um, into Northeast Syria in January. So uh, UN agencies, and particularly the WHO, had been using um, a crossing from Iraq into Northeast Syria, the Yarubia crossing. Uh, but uh, Russia and China decided, just on the eve of, of a global pandemic, um, that these uh, UN agencies would have to operate from Damascus. Um, and, and they blocked the UN's mandate for cross-border aid. And this mandate for cross-border aid is something that first came about in 2014. Um, and at that point in the Security Council, there was incredibly little that the members could, could agree on when it came to Syria. Uh, but one thing that was impossible to ignore was the scale of humanitarian need uh, in Syria and the fact that the Assad regime was, was neither willing nor capable of of delivering aid to, um, or of allowing um, UN aid to, to, to reach opposition held areas. So the UN uh, had designated four border crossings, two into the Northwest, one into the Northeast, and one into Southern Syria from, from Jordan um, to be used. And, um, and so when, but, but as the uh, conflict has, has dragged on and the situation has changed on the ground, um, this has become an increasingly political issue in the Security Council, and Russia in particular has viewed it as a, an opportunity um, to, to push for the normalization of the, of the Syrian uh, regime, of the Assad government, uh, and has viewed uh, the UN's ability to access um, opposition-held areas from, from uh, neighboring countries as an infringement on, on Syrian sovereignty. So they blocked it for the first time. Russia and China as well vetoed the renewal of the resolution and, and blocked this in January. Um, and the UN has been very clear about the impact that this has had on the, the region's preparedness for COVID-19. Um, and, and there's a really clear need to enhance access. Um, I mean, the, the healthcare uh, capacity doesn't meet the requirements in a, in a single province in the region. Um, and and uh, and so as 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 I've mentioned, the regime has really um, obstructed uh, the ability of um, authorities, local authorities in, in the area, to, to build their capacity. Now, it's I should say it's not only a political obstruction that makes aid access difficult. There are also some logistical challenges. Um, delivering aid from Damascus. Uh, is uh, either can be done by road, which is an incredibly long road. Um, a UN official said to me it frequently takes two weeks to deliver supplies from Damascus to the area. Um, you cross front lines. Um, th there are various security challenges along the way. Um, but but that's um, I, I think it is is really crucial to to stress just how much the, the regime has undermined um, the the access and the, and the preparedness for coronavirus, and it's already there in the region. As I said, uh, we have six confirmed cases so far, and uh, quite frankly, it's um, uh, it's really the the regime um, is is cutting off its uh, its most decisive face in, in this respect. If there are any outbreaks of coronavirus in Syria, it would be impossible to contain. It would spread more deeply throughout the country, and mercifully, so far, it has avoided a large scale outbreak. But I think um, as we talk about coronavirus and as we talk about even begin to talk about as a sort of post coronavirus uh, 
uh, era or time, um, I think it, it's really important um, not to not to um, uh, sort of or, or to to deny the um, the very very real dangers that still could lie ahead um, in Syria. Now, turning to the the northwest, I said it, it's difficult um, at the moment even to maintain current levels of humanitarian access. That's because um, Russia has previously stated its desire to block the two border crossings into Idlib um, or into northwest Syria, Bab al Hawa and Bab al Salam. Uh, and these two border crossings have, have been used more than, than ever in the last two months. In March and April, the UN um, counted the highest number of trucks of aid um, traveling into these areas um, through, since 2014, since, since this, uh, this cross-border operation began. Um, and that's because of the need that, that Germana touched on. I mean, um, that, that since the uh, regime offensive that began in, in December, we've seen nearly a million people displaced in the area. Um, many of these uh, remain displaced um, today and are, um, suffer from a catastrophic lack of, of medical supplies, um, even of, of, of food. Just last month in April, UN food intervention, interventions reached some 2.8 million Syrians in northwest, in northwest um, Syria. So I think um, you mentioned at the start the UN session Yes, yesterday the Security Council um, met to discuss UN humanitarian issues uh, in, in um, sorry, humanitarian issues in Syria, and there are really worrying signs that some of the Security Council members um, do not fully appreciate just how dire the situation could get in the area, um, and and um, some countries I think are. Um, uh, tempted to to follow the argument which Russia puts forward about the need to respect um, state Syria's state uh, sovereignty, and um, the U.S. is certainly trying to um, ensure a renewal of the of the cross border um, resolution at a minimum um, into northwest Syria. Um, clearly, there's a need to 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 enhance the UN's access to the northeast as well. Um, but I think there was a period of hope among the humanitarian community that the the threat of coronavirus um, w would raise the stakes to such a level that it would be difficult for even Russia to to veto um, this resolution. Now, Russia has not been moved by humanitarian concerns um, throughout the conflict, uh, but it, it would certainly be be catastrophic. Um, mercifully, there, there have been no confirmed cases of, of um, COVID-19 in the Northwest just yet. But when you think about the number of um, aid workers who are, who are traveling around in the area, the uh, presence of foreign um, fighters and whatnot, the, the possibilities of it spreading are very real. And the UN has been attempting to increase its capacity. I understand that it's increased the capacity of, um, of, uh, of, of ventilators in the area and has, has um, sent in an additional 30. Um, and it's in its plan um, is to have a, an additional 95 to meet the needs of, of these people. Um, but it's been quite slow there as well. And uh, and I think the the, the threat of, of COVID is very much looming over these discussions. Um, and unfortunately, though, it's political considerations um, that, that may end up um, sort of clouding, clouding the, the, the clear humanitarian imperatives. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Will. Um, Rich, so I, I want to ask a question um, about, you know, you, you and uh, Ambassador Jeffrey have been very clear about the need for, uh, to, to this political process at the UN 2254. And then the fact that you've been arguing very strongly that, you know, there is no um, future with Assad, Assad's, you know, uh, we are not going to get there um, uh, with Assad. Uh, some Assad's crimes are clear, um, and that that perspective obviously is not shared by Russia. Um, there's actually a question by Rhonda Slim of the Middle East you know, uh, Middle East Institute. She's asking this question as well. Has Moscow changed its objective of ensuring the survival of the Syrian state? Have they changed their assessment that? Assad's political survivor, survival is necessary for achieving this objective. 
So my question was going to be, how do you, how do we get there? Because you're being clear about this UN uh, process um, it, and it, there hasn't been a lot of movement, to be honest. And that largely relies on uh, uh, Russia and China's, mostly Russia's position, but China also enables that. Anyway, um, so can you address both that question uh, kind of similar to what I was going to ask? Certainly, yeah. And, and I, I saw Rhonda's question, and, and Rhonda, thank you. It's a great question, and yours as well, Kadir. Um, obviously, there's a certain degree of speculation in um, trying, you know, for me, uh, to try to correctly uh, scope and describe uh, Moscow's decision making. But we have some contact with them, and we have uh, sort of discussions that are relevant to this. I think uh, one thing that I would note right up front is that it's it's not just Moscow that wants the survival of the Syrian state. You know, I think everybody involved with this, Turkey, the United States. The Syrian people want the survival of the Syrian state. It's not so much regime change that, that is what we're after as change in the nature of the regime's treatment of its people. We don't see how that can happen with Assad in charge, but we, we have not for a long time made it a sine qua non uh, that, you know, remove Assad and then we talk. It's a process that's laid out in 2254. Now, do we think that there's a possibility that the Russians are, are warming up to 2254, which is something, you know, obviously they signed... Uh, up for at a certain point, or at least thinking that this process, which has been described as moribund by some, might actually take flight. I think there's reason to believe that. I think one reason to believe that is if you look at the signaling coming from uh, people in Moscow, not necessarily Putin, but people who probably wouldn't say what they're saying if they knew Putin didn't at least agree with the signaling, have come out. There's been a string of articles and, and public statements made by people close to uh, the Russian government that have directly criticized Assad and uh, called for sort of a, a questioning of whether he is the one to be able to take Syria into a stable position. I don't want to read too much into that. This could be tactical on the part of the Russians. It's not that they're ready to jettison a guy that they've committed so much to. Uh, but I think that there's pressure being put, and we can infer that pressure from these statements, on the Assad regime to make the sort of uh, compromises that would be necessary at least to start that as a skeptic, I think it's possible that the Russians and other supporters of the regime want to open that process up a little bit so that they can loosen some of the restrictions that are becoming quite onerous, both for the regime and for its supporters. That's okay. As a tactical first step, to get the Constitutional Committee uh, going in a fulsome way and to start talking about elections, which are the key components of 2254, needs to start somewhere. And I, I don't want to say time is on our side, but compared to a year ago or two years ago, uh, the inability, the incapacity of the Syrian regime is becoming much more obvious, even to the Russians. So I think, yes, I, I think, um, so Rhonda, the first part of the question, I don't think Moscow has changed uh, their views on the survival of the Syrian state, but, but then again, neither have we. We want the state to survive. We just want it to be passed through this crucible of, of reform called for by the United Nations in 2254. And as for the Russians, the second part of the question, which is the, the Russian view that is often uh, posited that only with Assad can the Syrian state survive. I think that's changing, I do. Uh, actually, just a quick follow-up, Rich. Do you, do you think that that has anything to do with uh, the COVID situation? I'm, I mean, the, uh, I'll, I'm asking you to put your analyst hat on, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we know you're a great strategist, strategic thinker, um, but, uh, in the COVID, you know, it has affected Russia's income with the, you know, oil prices going down so low. Uh, they seem to have pulled back to some extent in Libya as well. Uh, would you say that that's, that could be part of a kind of rethinking their role in the region, given the limited resources that they're under pressure, just like most states right now in the world, but... Uh, do you, do you see a trend towards that after the COVID-19 situation? I, I do. And, and I think COVID's just one piece of it. And, you know, the, another independent variable is uh, the, the price war over oil uh, that the Saudis and, and the Russians had started to engage in really coterminously, but, but independent from uh, the onset of the COVID pandemic. I think the Russian model for these engagements, both in Libya and in Syria, is to turn a modest investment 
through good timing and agile diplomacy and uh, decisive use of military force into outsized political gain. Now, when the cost ratio starts to change, when, when the, the object that you're trying to support, whether it's a Haftar or, or whether it's an Assad, uh, you know, as we, we sometimes say colloquially in the States, when, when you come to the conclusion that that dog won't hunt, then you, you come to a certain different conclusion about how you're supposed to pursue this. And look, the Turks are more or less an immovable object at this point for the Russians and the regime, absent a major Russian war against the Turkish presence in Idlib. The, the Turks have, what, 10,000, 15,000 troops, something like that. Now they continue to work on strengthening the Syrian National Army troops. They're continuing this, you know, trying to split drop by drop. I think uh, HDS is controlled, uh, and, and I think ultimately with the goal of um, finding what is reconcilable of, of that movement and pushing them towards the rest of the opposition. But the Turks aren't going anywhere anytime soon, not in Libya and, and not in Syria, and the Russians have to account for that as well. This, this mechanism of a cheap investment that has outsized gains worked to a point, but we're past that point. COVID's one of the things that changes the cost calculus, uh, but, it, but it's one of only three or four, including the fact that we're not leaving. And despite the fact that people sometimes in the press still say, well, the Americans uh, uh, abandoned uh, their partners and, and departed Syria. We haven't departed Syria. We've repositioned some, uh, but we're, we still have an ISIS problem there. The world still has an ISIS problem there, and we're dealing with that. Um, and there is a collateral benefit to that from, again, convincing the regime and the Russians that their cost calculations have been off. Thank you, Rich. Um, you mentioned Turkey's role. Jumana mentioned Turkey's role. And then there's a question on Turkey's role. Uh, I'll just read to you from Robert Friedman of Johns Hopkins University. Um, how have the Turks been treating the Kurds in Afrin and elsewhere in areas they've conquered uh, in northern Syria? That, uh, how can that situation be improved? Uh, they haven't conquered, they militarily control certain areas, but um, Jumana, I'll let you comment uh, uh, before I try to answer it myself, so, which is very sure, yeah. tempting, but I would go ahead. Obviously welcome you uh, chiming in here. Um, now, to my understanding, there's two um, uh, portfolios that have been open um, to look into the uh, the uh, the problems that have that obviously have taken place in Afrin, including displacement, um, and uh, I, I'm forgetting the name of the exact portfolio, but looking at some of the um, displacement and property lost and um, uh, crimes that have happened in those areas. I heard this from a member of the Syrian opposition, that this is a portfolio, some portfolios that have been open um, to look at, at some of these issues. Um, I, I don't actually know the, the, where they are in the process. I heard this very recently uh, from them. Um, obviously for, uh, you know, I, I think Syrians would like to see a, a free and independent Syria from, you know, all non-Syrian actors uh, in the future, it, whether it's Turkish, Russian, Iranian, um, um, even American, I mean, all these forces are expected to depart. Um, and that would obviously include in areas like Afrin um, and the Euphrates Shield. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think the displacement issue is something that, that has to be addressed. And I think I saw another question there from uh, CNM uh, also asking, about you know the the status of the displaced that are now in northeast that would like to return and this is obviously something that would need to um, that would need to be addressed in the future um, absolutely uh, I mean I think post war in many places of Syria where the displaced have been um, forced to flee be it in the suburbs of Damascus or or other locations that's that's part of a, um, a, a holistic uh, Syrian um, solution. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Jumana. I, ju I just can add maybe, um, you know, the, Tur the, the places Turkey controls, those interventions both in Euphrates Shield and Afrin were lar largely about PKK. Uh, there has been, because of the fighting, there's been displacement and, you know, PKK actually moved a lot of people around as well. Turkey's position has been on this to resettle people to the regions that they they were originally from, uh, so and they there is the, there's a number three hundred thousand people have been resettled uh, back in Syria from uh, you know who had left Syria for Turkey. They were living as refugees in Turkey. 
Um, but um, so I think Turkey's um, security concerns vis-a-vis -vis PKK plays a large role on the ground when they are dealing with, you know, civil society and uh, governance issues and other issues. Um, but um, let me just keep it brief, and I'll 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 switch to um, I'll turn to Will uh, without saying without giving my own presentation as to abusing my power. But uh, Will, um, you did talk about uh, you know how China and Russia block uh, could block the humanitarian access, um, um, and that is very. Um, it's not, and you mentioned, you know, there's, it's not just a political question, but all, there are also logistical challenges um, and millions have been di displaced. Um, how do you, I mean, some of the stuff that uh, Rich mentioned, you know, the, the, let's assume that Russia might be recalculating. Do you think that would be enough uh, or, or do you feel like U.S. has to offer something for to en enable that kind of access? I mean, what are the levers that the U.S. Uh, policy could use to enable your uh, recent analysis? You know, the the worst case scenario there that you know you if you can't access COVID situation could get much worse, and you know. Uh, humanitarian suffering will, would be exacerbated. Um, how do you see that dynamic? Yeah, I, I think that um, this is a, an incredibly important issue. And unfortunately, because Russia has the veto power, um, the US doesn't come to this sort of from a commanding position. Uh, it, it requires um, convincing Russia that it would be against its own interests, and I firmly believe it would be against Russia's own interests to um, to block uh, cross-border aid to the Northwest, as I said before. If coronavirus is able to spread anywhere in Syria, it will spread more broadly. But I think there are various ways that um, that the United States could could maybe play this. I would like to say that um, Ambassador Jeffrey and, and Rich's team has, has been um, wonderful in in highlighting the importance of cross border aid. The visit to the border um, in March with Ambassador um, Kelly Craft um, was was an important step, I think, in in raising the profile of these issues. Um, and 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 I think that that should be built upon. I think it could be taken even higher. I think Secretary Pompeo um, could 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 weigh in more vocally on these issues as well and express just how important it is to U.S. interests. There was recently a bipartisan letter from the um, House and Senate um, Foreign Affairs Committees um, urging Secretary Pompeo to, to, to push um, more forcefully in this regard. But I do think that there are perhaps some aspects of leverage that the United States might be underutilizing. And one of this is controversial, uh, but it's funding of the UN. Now, I Certainly, um, I'm not proposing that the U.S. should threaten to uh, withdraw, um, withdraw kind of on uh, um, in, a, in a blanket way funding um, for U.N. operations. But as Richard, as, as Rich mentioned before, these benefit regime-held areas as well. Um, U.S. Um, U.S. humanitarian support is going to Syrians all across the country, um, and they depend on it. And, and the U.S. is the largest donor to, um, to the U.N. In, in, in Syria. And I think that that provides a degree of leverage which has not perhaps fully been utilized because the U.N., um, well, quite frankly, U.N. officials are working under incredibly diff difficult uh, conditions. The regime placed, places um, extensive uh, obstacles on their operations. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, but I think if they had clearer guidelines from UN leadership about what is not acceptable in terms of meddling from the regime, then they could begin to change the regime's behavior in a small way, but I think it could be important. And one way of, of using the US funding as part of this leverage would be to, um, for example, shift aid away from UN agencies which have more problematic relationships with the Assad government towards ones which are showing a higher level of independence um, as a sort of incentive. 
And so I think that might be one way. And, uh, and, and again, that would have a big impact on Russia. Russia, um, I mean, the, the stability of, of, of Syria is something that's very much in Russia's interest. And, and Russia has no interest in seeing this humanitarian aid um, decrease. So, uh, so, so that's one part of this. I also think it might be possible to uh, cleave um, Russia from China in the in the UN Security Council. Um, Russia, uh, sorry, China has expressed um, an interest in showing global leadership on coronavirus and, and the COVID-19 response. And I think it would be utterly unjustified for it to simultaneously claim that it's trying to um, help countries around the world combat it while also blocking UN access to to northwest Syria at this time. Um, that's something that Ambassador Kraft raised yesterday in the Security Council. It didn't go down very well. Uh, China responded quite forcefully. Uh, but I think it's an important point, and I think it should be raised um, and stated in those terms, if not even more explicitly, China would be responsible if China um, blocks this or vetoes this resolution with Russia. They would be responsible for their levels of humanitarian suffering that would undoubtedly ensue in northwest Syria. Thank you, Will. Uh, there is a question actually related to the aid. Uh, I want to um, pose that to you. Uh, the question is from Michael Kurtzik, and it says, is there any real agricultural production going on in these areas, or are they all dependent on food aid? Can you, do you know, the, uh, can you assess the, how much these populations rely on aid versus, you know, local economy? Um, so I'm perhaps not best placed to, to talk, maybe Jamana might have more insights into this. Um, I can say on a broad level that northeast of Syria has traditionally been um, kind of breadbasket of Syria. Um, its agricultural lands uh, have suffered um, from various, uh, various things um, recently. Um, in particular, ISIS has been burning uh, huge amounts of um, fields and um, in, in the area, which has undermined um, agricultural production. Um, as I said though earlier, I think just last month, um, UN food security and uh, livelihood interventions in Northwest Syria reached 2.8 million people. So I think that shows the level of um, food insecurity in the region, um, but perhaps Jamana or, 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 or Rich has, have, have more points about the agricultural production. So I, I actually, I, I don't know as much about the agricultural production like Will, but I, if you don't mind, Kader, I wanted to add one point on, um, on the UN Security Council resolution um, that I, I think is important, is that, you know, in January, when the Northeast lost the Adobia border crossing, um, it, it forced, obviously, all aid to go through Damascus into Northeast, right, the UN aid. Um, that's the, I mean, other aid could still come through, but UN, UN funded aid. And what we've seen very clearly is the regime has not been willing to send the necessary aid to the Northeast. And this is something that we've brought to the attention. I mean, I think a lot of civil society groups, humanitarian organizations in the Northeast have made it very clear that the agreement was if Yadubias crossing was going to be closed, that they would have access to aid through demand. And the regime and Russia have deliberately withheld um, aid, and the aid that has been sent to the Northeast has very clearly been sent to clinics that are affiliated with regime figures. Um, it has not gone to the hospitals that need it most. It hasn't gone to the places where there are the displaced and the most vulnerable. Um, and so if anyone wants to know what it would look like if we were to also shut down the two last border crossings from Idlib, we have a sneak preview into what that would look like because I can't imagine the US, excuse me, the, the regime in Russia acting any differently than they have been acting um, in the Northeast. Okay, can I add uh, just another really quick point on that? <laughs> Sorry, sure. I don't want you to run off license. Um, but, but I think um, to, to the extent that they've been able to, local um, humanitarian organizations in the Northeast have tried to scale up their operations. And they certainly haven't been able to plug the gap, but they have been able to scale them up. One of the fears in the Northwest and why this would be particularly impactful to the Northwest uh, is that lots of these organizations are already operating to their maximum capacity. Um, they're dealing with, as, as Jamana said, this is a completely unprecedented displacement uh, crisis throughout the, the Syrian um, conflict. And so they would lose not only the actual supplies getting across the, the border, they would probably also lose um, the UN funding mechanisms 
um, and, and they just wouldn't be able to scale up. So I think that's uh, just sort of one other small point about just how dire it would be in the, in the Northwest. Thank you, Will. Um, I want to pass it to Rich uh, if he has any comments on, on what has just been said about the humanitarian aid. But then we have quite a few questions, actually. I'm, I'm really happily um, um, pleased that, you know, people are asking a lot of questions here. I want to get them as, you know, get all of them answered, hopefully. Uh, Richard, please. Sure. I, I don't have a whole lot to, to add except for uh, on the question about agricultural production. I know that the, in the Northeast, uh, traditionally, that has sort of been the breadbasket of Syria. And I, I think Idlib has a healthy and peaceful times, a very healthy agricultural um, uh, economy as well. In the Northeast, it's been less affected. Uh, and I think even the fact that there's some mixture of regime and Russian and other troops, it's sort of a, um, a very complicated security situation. It is stable enough to sustain agricultural production. I've seen some numbers, I can't quote them off the top of my head, but I think they're doing okay there. I think the Northwest has seen more, more disruption because the fighting has been more direct, um, although there's some stability now. I don't think that that's the biggest problem that, that they're facing right now. I think security uh, and, and potentially now that COVID as well are probably bigger problems than lack of food uh, in those areas. Uh, Rich, very quickly, uh, the dynamic Jumana mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Assad regime picks and chooses where they send it. Do, does the U.S. have any kind of a mechanism to, to do anything about that? Well, most of, most of our humanitarian assistance goes through multilateral uh, mechanisms like the World Food Program and things like that. So yeah. we typically don't uh, as you might guess, uh, interface with them directly. But there are, in many cases, like Rukban is an example, and I had seen that there was a question about Rukban. Rukban was a very bad situation. It remains a, a bad situation, although the scale of the problem is smaller. And we've gone through great gyrations trying to get deliveries, either from the Jordanian side or to work with the UN uh, for them to get permissions to deliver from Damascus. And frankly, the obstructionism on the part of the regime has been a big part of the problem because the, the sad fact is that in most cases, they sort of want to starve out these populations so that they can regain uh, direct regime control of the areas. So we don't have a direct mechanism for that other than increasing aid and working multilaterally in the areas that we can reach. Thank you. Uh, the question Rich just mentioned is, uh, can we hear more on the U.S. policy on the al Rukban camp and the problem caused by the YPG SDF forces in Deir Zor? Is the U.S. doing anything on this? Um, Rich, if you're good with your answer earlier, I'll just go to other panelists. Jumana, maybe, to answer that. Jumana, do you have anything to add? No. To what Rich said? To, to this question about the Rukban camp and the- No, no. I will, I'm good. Yeah. All right. OK, great. I'll, I'll have that question answered. So, I'll, let me just go to the next question. We, are, uh, we have 15 more minutes. Um, could you comment on the pro pro protest activity in the provinces of Sueda and Dara in a pandemic? How important is the local population's dissatisfaction with the regime amid other problems? Is it possible to somehow, uh, quote, quote unquote, grope the US position on this? Um, Alexander Hoffman from Strategic Center, Russia. Jumana, do you have anything for this? I'd actually be curious um, to hear what Rich uh, has to say about this. But I mean, briefly, you know, in Sueda, it was, uh, you know, the, um, it was really, I mean, it was related mostly to, it was not sort of an overthrow the regime type of movement. It was very clearly, you know, rooted in, um, uh, I think it was Khalina Naish. It was, a, you know, they, it was a matter of uh, protesting about living standards, food, the accessibility to food, um, and, uh, you know, and really revealing the deep economic problems that Rich was mentioning that were, you know, the, with the the Syrian economy and the sanctions, also what's happening in Lebanon next door, how this was impacting the overall Syrian economy, accessibility to employment, to jobs, etc. Uh, with Daraa, it's a little bit different because you have, um, you've had 
movements there on and off, I think, uh, since that I went back to, you know, technically we're back to regime control. Um, and you have Russian presence there in some areas, but the regime does not control in, in a, in a, um, all areas of Dara in the same fashion. And the Russians also operate differently in certain parts of Dara. Um, but this, you know, this has, this is, I mean, I think in both areas, what it's showing us is, you know, while the military phase of this conflict in some areas of Syria might be over, there is still deep discontent, uh, whether it's with certain governance, you know, governance mechanisms of the regime or with just basic uh, access to food um, and, and employment. And so, and this is to be expected, right? Because the regime is never going to rule the way it did uh, pre-2011 because it, it has never actually addressed the root causes of this conflict. I'll stop there. Thank you. Rich? Sure. Uh, well, I think it's a great question uh, from Mr. Hoffman. And I think Jomana, uh, Jomana answered much of it. Um, so I would probably differ in one aspect. I don't think that, the, that we can say that the war has ended in these areas. If you look at Dara and Sueda, there's uh, been a running series of uh, assassinations of both reconciled officials and government troops at checkpoints and things like that. I think it, it seems to me that the case that both the regime is killing people that it seemed that it said it had uh, reconciled with and that the people that are reconciled are fighting back. Uh, there was a video on social media that was released, I think about two weeks ago, of major armored formations being sent down to that area. That area is a good uh, fast forward to how all of Syria will look if there's no 2254 and if Assad, quote, wins because the rest of the international community gives up on this. That's what's going to happen. Some people remember that uh, after Hafez al-Assad crushed uh, Hama in 1982, that they were still fighting in Idlib in 1985. That, you know, you don't, when there is no political compromise, you don't actually get a political solution. What you get is a bunch of killing and then you, you tamp it down uh, in terms of security for a while and then the people flare back up again. Uh, this regime is much weaker relative to the opposition and to the neighbors than Hafez al-Assad Syria was in the early 80s. He can't pacify the country, certainly not by force. So yeah, I, I, I think that it's not just protest that's going down in Southwest um, Syria. Uh, it's also the, um, the, the just justifications for resistance that were still there, as Yomana said, that were there at the beginning in 2011 are still there now. You layer over that the fact that, that the regime is allowing uh, a militarization of Southwest Syria uh, by the Iranians and by Hezbollah, and, and that this has also gone in other parts of Syria, and that the Israelis are not going to simply let that happen. And it becomes even clearer that, that there is no peace in Southwest Syria and there is no pacification. These, these deals that the regime made are not deals because there's no will on their side to back them up. So I, I think it's, again, I take them very seriously. I think it's something beyond uh, protests and it's something that's not gonna get better until we have a fundamental political compromise achieved under 2254. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I think I'm gonna continue, have to continue with you, with you because uh, there's a question on resurgence of IS in uh, Syria and Iraq. What's your exit strategy? The object objectives of the U.S. are quite long-term, whereas your leadership doesn't think long-term when it comes to troop commitments. That's the question by Paula Fastrovioto. So um, the resurgence, of, you mentioned earlier that you, the U.S. remains in Syria because of ISIS. Um, so where what are the parameters for you uh, of you know, having the finished, having finished the fight against ISIS, I guess. Yeah. Well, so it, as I said at the beginning, we still have an ISIS problem and the world has an ISIS problem. The ISIS problem is worse where governance is worse because in a sense, it's a symptom of political dysfunction. And many of the people who uh, find themselves uh, either tolerating or working with ISIS, uh, as has happened with other terrorist groups before, normally it's out of fear because there's a vacuum of security provided by the state or by co-optation through various means. You'll note that in Syria, the recent um, uh, attacks in which ISIS was able to temporarily take territory or kill a, a significant number of people happened in regime controlled, regime -controlled areas. Um, there have been some attacks further east, east of the river, and there's, you know, obviously we've got concern about that. Um, ultimately, the, the exit strategy, I don't like that term um, because, you know, I, 
it implies something more specific in terms of when people leave where and our experience with specific uh, troop withdrawal plans has been spotty. And, uh, but what I will say is the solution, the mechanism of solution or the theory of victory here is a combination of a political settlement uh, that reduces everyone's uh, willingness to support or tolerate violence because there is actually a process that's representative of most Syrians and a different but parallel problem in Iraq um, that we, we continue a relentless campaign uh, of going after the actual terrorists, the people that are carrying out these attacks uh, and making sure that they don't have the ability to do anything um, long-term or sustained. Uh, and then frankly, the, uh, the reconstruction piece, once the political solution is in train, we'll, we'll take care of a lot of that as well, because frankly, uh, people's sense of economic well-being doesn't correlate exactly to, to terrorist activity, but it's one of the things that contributes to it as well. So there's a kinetic portion to this, there's a financial portion to this, but more, more than anything else, there's a political portion to this. And as long as an unreconstructed Assad regime is running Damascus, you're gonna have that ISIS problem in Syria. Thank you, Rich. I wanna to turn to Will. Uh, there's a follow-up to the earlier question about food production. How about the infrastructure looking like? In your report, you actually talk about, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're talking about the number of doctors, hospitals, et cetera, that, that is extremely limited. I'll let you answer that if you can. And then the, perhaps another question I can tie to that uh, it, by Jusaima Moy uh, is, is about political process. Would you know, a, a solution to humanitarian uh, access issues contribute to political process? Um, thank you. So on the infrastructure part, um, I mean, just just since December, um, the Syrian regime and its and its allies um, hit eighty four medical facilities in northwest Syria. Uh, so so it 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 it's something that's systematic. That the human suffering is not just a, a sort of consequence of, of what the regime is trying to do, it's, it's the aim. And just to, to go back to what happened in, um, in, in, in the South and, and what's happening in Dara at the moment, um, a, a UN official kind of said in, in, in a private setting that 50% of the UN's uh, requests to reach uh, technically regime held areas of Southern Syria were rejected in 2019. So that's, it's, well, I talked about how the, the regime is, is uh, obstructing access to, to opposition held areas, but it's also obstructing access to areas which it technically controls. So I think this is a, yet another bit of, uh, another piece of evidence that it is, that it uses um, humanitarian um, access um, as, a, as, a, as a political tool. So on the, on the point about um, whether or not a humanitarian solution would, would sort of help lead to a political solution i mean no i, I think the two things are, are quite separate and i think i mean quite frankly syria's humanitarian needs are so severe that there will not be a solution to them um even if the regime ended its its um obstruction um the, the un appeals are constantly underfunded uh the, the scale of the need is just so vast that we will not sort of solve the humanitarian situation i do think that um, allowing uh, people to continue their lives and allowing people to fend for themselves is an important part of, of local peace building um, efforts and, and creates the conditions in which perhaps a, a political solution or might be some kind of stability is, 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 is more likely. But um, I think it's, it's um, I, I tried to be careful about my point earlier about using um, sort of the US leveraging its, its funding for the UN. I think leveraging humanitarian um, needs is, is, a, is something that's very dangerous um, and something that I would um, urge against um, on the whole. But I think um, these things are all intertwined um, in, in Syria. Thank you, uh, Will. I w there are two questions that are related to directly directed again, uh, towards Jumana. I want to ask them, Jumana, um, Rhonda Slim again uh, is asking, are constitutional issues a priority for the majority of Syrians, especially in a COVID-19 era? Uh, 
If not, what are these priorities? How is the Syrian opposition connecting to them? And then the other question is by Suel El Ghazi. What's the future of the Constitutional Committee, committee now that we are seeing an unprecedented Kurdish dialogue between the SDF and the KNC? How this could also affect the Geneva negotiations in the future? Uh, I had seen a piece of news about those negotiations failing, but um, but I'll let you answer, Jumana, please. Sure, sure. So just out of full disclosure, I am a member of the Constitutional Committee and the Civil Society Group. So I think that's why Suhail and Renda directed those questions to me. Um, now, it's no secret that, um, you know, the Syrian people, when they went out in 2011, they're in their protests, they were not chanting, you know, the, the aim of their protests was not to modify or to change or to rewrite the Syrian constitution. That needs to be stated very clearly. Um, and it is, you know, that is the reason why so many Syrians were very frustrated to see that the one international initiative that the major countries involved were able to agree on was uh, the rewriting of the Syrian constitution. Um, but that being said, you know, Envoy Peterson made numerous statements, you know, saying that this would only be, you know, the opening of the door in hopes that other portfolios in addition to the writing of the constitution would be open. Most importantly, things um, pertaining to the uh, political detainees, political prisoners, the missing, the detained, um, as well as the return of refugees um, and, you know, permanent ceasefires, et cetera. So this was supposed to be the first of many other other, uh, other important portfolios. Um, the other issue um, is that, uh, you know, how, how these people were, were they representative or not, given the fact that they were selected by, by different governments, by different, um, uh, you know, uh, the opposition was, you know, they made the selections themselves, etc. Like how representative uh, would this actually be of the Syrian people because they were not voted including myself, we were not voted into this position. Um, and so that, that goes to the heart of Renda's question, is that, you know, how much has, um, have members been able to actually represent um, uh, the Syrian people? And it's a very valid question, and it's something that um, is, you know, is, is not, um, is, is, will pose a problem, I think, in the future for if anything are, is to come of this. In, and, and this goes to Suhail's question question about uh, the inclusion of uh, the SDF or the Kurd, you know, Kurdish representation on the, um, on the uh, committee itself, which is a very valid concern. Um, this is something I've spoken about publicly before that, um, you know, it is, it is the hope. I think there've been many efforts at Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia and other regional governments um, have have tried to play a role in in the you know trying to integrate um, the uh, SDF and and other Kurdish groups into the process um, for for various motivations. By the way, I should add, um, but the, you know the U.S. government has also been um, supporting some of these efforts. I know. Um, uh, William Robeck was, you know, that was the, the what you're talking about is the, the piece in El Monitor last week um, that that talked about this. Um, Masoud Barazani has also been involved, given his warm relationship with both the Kurdish government, uh, the Turkish government, as well as Syria's Kurds. So a lot of different um, entities have been involved in trying to uh, have a greater uh, number of Kurds as part of this constitutional process. And I think it's going to be very important for the for the committee to be representative. But that being said, all of this being said, um, and I, I don't like to be pessimistic, given that I'm part of this process, but the reality is that behind closed doors, several different uh, governments, even those who are publicly supporting this uh, process, do have very uh, serious concerns, and rightfully so, about the fact that this you know, constitutional process is being done um, as sort of a cure-all for, uh, for serious problems in, in most, uh, po you know, immediate post-conflict scenarios. You have the peace process that lays out uh, specific agreements on various important issues and then a separate constitutional track in order to address issues that really are are meant to be in a constitution that is long lasting and 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 is meant to um 
uh, lay the framework for future governance in a country. And it's very difficult to do both at the same time, which is why um, the Constitutional Committee has really been at a standstill, I think, uh, and has not been able to move forward in the way that Envoy Peterson had hoped. So I, I don't know if it's going to be a successful endeavor. We have yet to see. Uh, for now, you know, COVID is sort of the excuse that's being used um, uh, by the Syrian regime and the Russians to uh, justify delay, but the regime was happily delaying this process even before COVID. So um, I am very skeptical about the ability of this, you know, to move forward in a positive direction post COVID. Thank you, Jumana. We are running out of time, but I want to accomplish getting all the questions answered. Uh, Rich, there are two questions I'm, I, you can see on the screen probably. Uh, are there U.S. plans to make changes in SDF health de resort? Uh, there are continued rumors about this. Vladimir uh, is asking this. And there is another question by him as well. Is the U.S. supporting unity talks between KNC and PYD? Is the goal of these talks to make the Northeast administration more acceptable to Turkey? Uh, Vladimir always asks the hard questions. So uh, qu quick answers. Uh, I, I am not aware of any plans to change the status of Deir Azor, uh, but then again, uh, at that level, we're probably talking about sort of military operational planning that would be conducted by um, CJTF uh, OIR, Operation Inherent Resolve. So I, I, I hate to beg off of that question, Vladimir, but probably they would know better about what sorts of operational plans. But if you're talking about sort of big picture, you know, uh, pulling out, removing, changing structures there, I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, and on the second part, look, uh, it has been our, our position that a dialogue, I mean, a dialogue among different political forces and different uh, groups in Northeast Syria is needed, period. That's, that hopefully will fold right into 2254. Uh, but the fact that there has been uh, an arrangement um, that has uh, sort of evolved alongside the de-ISIS campaign is a fact, and it has resulted in an administrative mechanism that has more or less worked. I don't think anybody thinks that that's what Northeast Syria or the rest of Syria um, has in mind or deserves in terms of governance in the future. So something's got to start there. At some point, uh, the opposition and uh, the the autonomous administration, whatever you want to call it, and I don't want to get into pejoratives or whatever, but the, the folks that are running most of the Northeast right now, and the folks that are running the other parts of it, like the Turks and, and the Turkish supported opposition, uh, and the broader uh, opposition all need to talk. One way to start that sort of conversation about, if you call it power sharing, you can call it, um, it, it's not about external representation. It's not about Geneva. And I've heard those kind of questions as well. It's about how does administration and, and how does life in the Northeast of Syria work? And what are the political freedoms? Does the KNC, which has complained previously um, ab about uh, constriction of its ability to practice politics in heavily Kurdish areas, do they have a right to practice politics in the heavily Kurdish areas? That, that's a fundamental question that needs to be addressed. The United States supports this kind of dialogue to broaden uh, pluralization of, uh, of politics and, and normal political life. It's a long way off from that. And I don't think people should read too much into that. But yes, as, as a general proposition, we support those talks and we support uh, broadening of the political space in the Northeast. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, there is one last question and that's directed towards me. Of course, it's a hard question by Daniel Server. Uh, he says, what's the status of Turkish troops and officials inside Syria? Are they observing the fourth Geneva Convention on treatment of civilians and governance in the areas they control? Uh, I'm not 100% sure about this. Uh, if the, what, what kind of status, well, I mean, legally, uh, but I know that Turkey is there for self-defense, but I don't know how legal framework uh, works and Turkey does a lot in terms of you know humanitarian help and uh, trying to figure out the civilian dynamics governance dynamics on the ground but these are broad comments that I can make I, I'm not uh, extremely you know detailed about about this but I know that you know it's always uh, as I mentioned earlier Turkey is concerned extremely concerned about PYD presence P PKK presence on the ground and how they uh, kind of uh, blow up local dynamics uh, with other ethnic groups. Um, so 
Uh, I know this is not the most satisfactory answer, but uh, that's gonna have to do. Um, so I just wanna give 30 seconds each uh, if you have any final comments. Other than that, uh, this has been an extremely comprehensive discussion and I'm really impressed by like some dozen questions that we've received. Uh, do you, please, Will, let's start with you. Sure, I suppose I would, um, I, I would repeat something that I, I mentioned briefly before, which is so far it seems that coronavirus has not spread that widely in Syria. Um, in part, that's because the government is not transparent about testing and also lacks the capacity to, 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 to do a lot of testing. But I just want to stress this does not mean that Syria has um, es escaped this, the, 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 the true danger of this pandemic. Um, if the conditions are allowed to, to continue and to exist, uh, in, in which the pandemic can spread, then Syria, this will be a new level of suffering on all of the other levels of, of suffering that, that the Syrian people have gone through. Um, and so I would just urge uh, the UN Security Council members to, to um, avoid playing political games about this and to focus on the, the humanitarian needs and doing whatever they can to enhance Syria's ability to defend against this pandemic. Thank you, Jumana. Um, you know, I for me, I think the the the, the critical piece in, in in solving a lot of these problems in Syria um, really goes back to. Uh, I know it's become sort of an an overplayed tune, but the 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 civil society groups that we have seen develop in Syria over time. Um, can and should be supported by, and they should be seen as really reliable actors by the, the Turkish government, by the US government, by the Europeans, by others who frankly, in many instances have invested in them over the last 10 years, um, but have been largely abandoned over the past three years. And their challenges have only grown um, in, in Northwest Syria and Northeast Syria and inside of government areas, as we were saying about Dara, Sweda. Um, and I, I can't emphasize enough really the need um, to, to go back to communicating with them, you know, um, and probing them for, for how we can lay the groundwork outside of sort of the military solutions that everyone, including the United States, seem to be saying, you know, they're, they're turning their back on. Um, and, you know, outside of Assad, there is still that middle ground with civil society that I think will hold the key to legitimizing political settlements that may be reached, um, that will lay the brown, groundwork for counterterrorism efforts uh, that, that are necessary. And so I just, I'd, I'd really like to be, um, um, and, you know, emphasize that as we must go back there. We must reconsider our um, policy on this. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, you have the final word. Okay, great. Well, thank you. This has been a wonderful event and, and really timely and important to keep focus on this, even though um, COVID rightfully has been a focus of everyone's uh, attention in recent months. Look, every war ends. Uh, wars end in a variety of ways. This has been a particularly brutal, ugly, long war. Uh, one way that wars end is with an outright mil uh, military victory by one side or the other. That's not going to happen. That's pretty clear here. Uh, another way wars end is through the exhaustion of the parties involved and people essentially go back to status quo because they realize a problem can't be solved. I don't think that's what's going to happen here. I don't think that's what's going. That does count on the international community uh, putting fatigue ahead of principles. And so far we're not doing that. And I'm very pleased to say that the, the coalition of folks um, working with the United States, both to resolve the Syrian conflict and uh, to defeat ISIS uh, have been remained steadfast in general, uh, in general. So I don't think that's where it's going. A third uh, way that wars end is when stakeholders, internal and external, with sufficient power, uh, decide that it's time to take coordinated action and to get it done. I think that's the best that we can hope for, and I think we're closer to it now than we have been at any point in the last five or six years. Uh, we have some work to do. There's some dynamics that need to play out, but I, uh, I think that that's the path we need to push for because the Syrian people deserve that. Uh, they don't deserve what, what they've had, and they don't deserve the other two possible outcomes, so we'll keep pressing for it. Well, uh, as I said a little earlier, this has been a great discussion, very comprehensive. I really, uh, I'm, I'm, I feel like uh, 
I've invited the right people uh, in this right uh, in, for this topic. I really appreciate your presence here. I want to thank our uh, attendees on Zoom uh, for their uh, really thoughtful questions. I want to thank them as well. Please join me in uh, congratulating the panel virtually. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, we'll we'll um, we'll meet on another occasion. We we regularly do Syria events. Of course, uh, we will continue to do them. Again, thank you very much, all. Thanks.